Fourier transforms are profoundly important for understanding extended XFs. The decomposition of the oscillations in the X-ray absorption coefficient above the edge into an intensity distribution as a function of distance from the absorbing atom, which is what a Fourier transform provides, was pivotal in de the development of the modern understanding of extended XFs. Hi, I'm Matt Newville, and this is part of the video series for using LARCH for XFs analysis. So far in this series, we've worked with XFs and Zanes data as a function of X-ray energy and treated Zanes spectroscopically, thinking about the spectra in terms of the electronic energy states of the absorbing atom. For understanding extended XFs, the oscillations in the absorption coefficient are separated from the slowly varying part of the absorption coefficient and recast as a function of the wave number K of the photoelectron emitted in the absorption process. Like any other oscillatory function, a Fourier analysis of these XFs analysis can be highly informative, and a Fourier transform of the XFs as a function of wave number k is important for understanding and analyzing any XFs data. In this video, we'll go over some of the properties of the Fourier transform for XFs and show how to perform the Fourier transforms for visualization and interpreting of extended XFs data. All of the analysis procedures and videos going forward from here will use Fourier transforms described here. In fact, I'm going to gloss over much of the discussion of the ex extraction, isolation of the XFs from the absorption coefficient or background subtraction until the next video, as this also is much easier to understand with knowledge of how Fourier transforms work. So let's start by reading in some XFs data. I have a, a project here that has all of the data that we'll include in this video. Um, and we'll go over some of these sets in order. So here's some uh, arsenic K edge data on an arsenic sulfide. And we'll look at, here's the, the XFs, the normalized mu. If we zoom in on this, you can see that there's a nice oscillatory uh, behavior to the XFs. In fact, for this data set, there's really only one frequency, which is why we're going to start with that. So we'll go over, now that we have the data and we have really pretty well normalized data, um, we can go over to the XAFs tab we'll, where we'll work with to do background subtraction and Fourier transforms. So from here, we can look at the background subtraction. So, so we'll show uh, mu of E and the background that we would subtract. I'll go over this in the next video, over the details of how this is chosen. But for now, we can just look at that as we're going to subtract the, blue the red curve from the blue curve. We're going to subtract those two and generate uh, the isolated XFs. Here, it's a function of energy. And you can see that it doesn't oscillate with a, with a single frequency in energy. But if we transform that to wave number, chi of k, then it looks like it does oscillate with a single frequency in k. Here I've also uh, weighted the data, as is commonly done in the literature and for analysis, by some power of k. So I've multiplied by k squared. If I change this to k1 weighting, it, it looks like that. And k0 weighting, so that's just chi of k, the isolated chi of k, we, and shows why we often uh, use a K weighting, K weighting of one, emphasizes the high K, high wave number values. Um, and it's typical to use a weighting of three or two, sometimes one is used in the literature. Um, I'll probably just stick with two throughout this video, uh, just for clarity, just for consistency. <clears throat> so you can see that, that the data seems like it has a pretty simple single frequency in, to it. And in fact, it does. If we uh, if we do the Fourier transform, so we can I'll explain what these parameters are down here. We can just show what the result of that is, and we'll, we'll get a a plot that looks like this: a single frequency here peaked up just below two angstroms. There's a little bit of a second peak here, not very strong, and then it's pretty close to zero. Um, all the way out to 10 angstroms, as far as we've gone out to include this. So let's talk about how we got there. Let's go back to our, so, so that shows a single frequency, a single bond distance, a single neighbor at a single distance. Let's go back to our 
plot of chi of k, and we'll look at how we, and I'll bring up a second plot of the, of the chi of r data here. So if I show those two together, um, you can see both of those. And these are really common plots to see in the literature for extended XAS data. K, some k-weighting of chi of k, and some Fourier transform typically shown as the magnitude. In fact, the Fourier transform is a complex mapping of, of uh, frequencies. It's a, so it's a frequency distribution, so you could count how long is a period, and that's here at two angstroms. Um, what we've done for, to make that Fourier transform was we first multiplied by a windowing function. So it, in order to help lower the um, lower some of the artifacts that can arise in the Fourier transform, we first multiplied by this smooth function here. This smooth function is defined here in this Fourier transform section of the XAS viewer XAFs page. So here we've, t I'll start with what a different window looks like because a simpler window would be to, might look like, might look like this. And this, in, in older days, this was a common approach to use a window that starts, function that starts at zero and then multiplies by one over most of the range. And here we're going from two and a half to 15.3 inverse angstroms. Why don't we just make that a nice round 15? Um, and, and we're over this range here, two and a half, but we're going plus or minus one, or over, over dk of one inverse angstroms means that over one angstrom centered at 2.5, it goes up from zero to one. And similarly, uh, at, the, at the high k end, around 15 with a, with a window size of one inverse angstrom, it goes from one down to zero. And then this is our, and then this is the resulting Fourier transform. And in fact, if we, if we pick different values for K weight, uh, we see that what, the reason we use a K weighting at all, or, or a, a window at all, is that if, as we make this, if I set this to zero, so that that goes from zero to one over a very short range, over effectively instant, um, then we see in the Fourier transform these oscillations here that are some ripple that happen. This is typical truncation ripples that happen in Fourier transforms um, that are common. And so if we increase this window or this window size or the size of the windowsill, you can see that those, those uh, oscillations are suppressed. And the reason, to, the reason that can be important is because although I, I'm saying that this one, this spectra has one clear, obvious frequency to it, there is this other stuff out here, and you may want to analyze that. In fact, for many XFs, real XFs problems, the first shell is less interesting than the second shell. Um, and having a small second shell, you still may want to analyze that. And so understanding what the size of these absorption or these Fourier transform truncation ripples are is important for understanding whether this stuff is real. It is all real, but whether it's whether it's meaningful um, or is just part of the ripple in the from the Fourier transform. So another way another way to reduce that even further is just to make the windows really large. The challenge with that is that is that it also tends to uh, depress the oscillations. So these oscillations are now clearer, but they're but they're smoother. They're they're less well defined. Um, We can also we can also change the weighting that's done in the Fourier transform, uh, but for now I think that that's a good that's a good start. I, oh I, I didn't I forgot to mention that the Fourier transform has both is is a complex transform taking this oscillation oscillating function and transforming it into real and imaginary components. And so in fact, although you will see throughout the literature, plots like this of the magnitude of chi of k, it's important to understand um, that really the, the data that's a transform of this oscillatory chi of k 
also has oscillations in it and that those oscillations, although they're a little bit more difficult to interpret, are real and important. Those, that's really the data and what we plot is the magnitude of the data. There's also a phase, but that's even harder to sort of understand. Um, the magnitude is very easy to understand because that tells you that there's a peak there. So in fact, it's also, it's also important to understand, I guess I can talk about this right now, that this looks like a, a distribution function, a pair distribution function, so that there is a, a central atom here of arsenic and then a neighboring atom of sulfur, and you might, and that's peaked up at this value of just below two. <clears throat> as we'll describe in more detail, uh, or as you will see in XAFs lectures and, and uh, in theoretical descriptions of XAFs, that does not mean that the arsenic sulfur distance is 1.8 or five angstroms. It actually means it's more like 2.2 angstroms, about a half, of an, a half of an angstrom further than where this peak is. And that's because the XAFs equation has a KR term in it, but also has a phase shift term. And that phase shift term is basically constant or to first order constant in K. And so it gives a negative shift of the peaks relative to their where they're where the real distance is. So the transform of the data is not just a simple radial distribution function, but has these other components in it <clears throat> that are due to the photoelectron wave, wave scattering from the neighboring atom, <clears throat> including doing phase shifts. <clears throat> so the, the peak is not uh, where the distance is. It is correct, uh, to be clear, it is correct. It's just not the where the distance is okay um and and also we need to care carefully think about the data both in terms of the real and or imaginary components and the uh, magnitude actually since since the original data is strictly real the when you fourier transform the real and imaginary components are not um are not actually meaningfully different we forced the imaginary part of the measurement to be zero, or we asserted the, the imaginary part of the measurement is zero, and that tells us that the real and imaginary parts of the Fourier transform are not independent. Okay, so that's that's um, the Fourier transform to our space. It's typical in the in the literature, especially the older literature, to also transform once back again from to a back Fourier transform from R back to K space so that you can look at a shell to, or a portion of the, a contribution, a shell, a path from the XAFs as a single thing. So we could do that here. We could plot with chi of R another window function that we're gonna use for transforming back to, to K space. We can transform from K to R and then we can transform back from R to K. That's really just Fourier filtering and if we pick an R, a window of R, we can filter out or in some of the different components. So here, if I, if I use a window like this, where that goes from about one angstrom up to six, inverse ang or six angstroms in R space, that basically is the full uh, set of information in the data. So then if I plot in the first window the chi of k with the filtered k, you see that the filtered K here in blue is a little less noisy, but pretty effectively reproduces the, the measured chi of K, K weight of chi of K. If I select uh, the window to be more narrow around the first shell, the first peak here, you can see that there's a little bit of discrepancy, but it's not too far off, that's because the first shell is most of this data. And with this data set, if I, maybe I'll bring this back up and eliminate the first shell, if I eliminate the first shell, then you can see what's left. What's not in the first shell is this part of the oscillation. You can see a few things here. And we'll, we'll go into this in more detail with the next data sets. First of all, you can see that the frequency of the, those oscillations is higher. This is, R is the frequency of the of the oscillations in K. So it makes sense that those are um, those are higher frequency oscillations. And you can also see that the, the 
the intensity is lower. That's because this and the, this peak intensity is lower, so that's that peak intensity is lower. Fourier transform is a linear transform, so uh, big components in in R space will transform to large uh, amplitude components in K space as well. Okay, so that's that's to do a Fourier. We talked a little about doing a Fourier transform back. Actually, for a for a Fourier transform, you can also pick a different these different window functions. I guess I could go into um, selecting different different window functions for um, here with this data set for for using uh, for the Fourier transforms in in K space in, in R space from K to R space. So here is the Kaiser Bessel window with a DK value of around three. Actually, I typically use, I should say, and I, I recommend using a DK of about four in the Kaiser Bessel window. It seems to be the most robust for all data sets. But there are other window functions. You'll see that the Hanning window is quite commonly used. And, the, and you also see, will see that there isn't much difference in the results. There's still a peak at the same position, and the and the differences are all in how these lower intensity peaks are separated and pop out from the noise level of the data. And you're, you're perfectly fine to use a different set of window functions. These are all common in other Fourier analysis of other kinds of spectra or data. Um, and they're all available here. You can, you're welcome to use them uh, to your heart's content. I'll probably just stick with the Kaiser Bessel or the Hanning window um, for all of this, all of the data analysis in this video and going forward. So let's move on to another data set. So here's here's iron uh, oxide. That's not a very good for your transfer or background subtraction. That's better. Um, this is this then clearly is a much more complicated um, spe uh, spectra. Um, and we'll come back. So here you see two main frequencies and some other stuff up here. So clearly there's a lot of things going on. And if we Fourier filter this data set, so I'll do the same thing where I'll show the window function uh, of chi of r, and I'll go down here and select just the first, sort of just this first shell. Um, and then plot that with the with the filtered chi of k. That's the first shell. It's a low frequency oscillation, relatively low frequency oscillation. And then there's this other shell here. Uh, those are the two shells together. And then this shell here. Uh, that frequency component there that actually dominates the specter is from this second shell. Maybe I can get that a little more isolated. So that's that's also so that would be this is iron oxide that's the iron oxygen shell and this is the iron iron shell. There's a couple of things that you'll, you may have noticed in that. One is that the iron these iron iron oscillations here from this shell persist out to higher k than the uh, than the oscillations of just the oxygen. I'm telling you that's oxygen. You'll, believe, you'll have to believe me. The the oxygen oscillations peak up here maybe at three to six inverse angstroms, whereas the iron-iron oscillations peak up at higher k. That's a, that's a feature of, they go out six or seven or eight inverse angstroms. That's a feature of, of the scattering properties of the elements, that higher z elements tend to scatter at, out to higher k. Um, in fact, let's look at the iron metal spectrum. Let's skip over the palladium oxide for a second. We'll go to the iron oxygen spectrum, and I'm going to go back to just looking at uh, chi of k with a windowing function and just the simple Fourier, uh, simple Fourier transform amplitude. Here we have some here also a fairly rich chi of k spectra, but we can understand this in terms of there's sort of three peaks here in the in the Fourier transform. There's a uh, first peak, the smallest at smaller like second or second and third, and then uh, another neighbor here. And let's look at isolating um, those spectra 
the, those those uh, spectral components, those shells from each other. Let's look at the Kaiva with the window and the filtered spectra again. If I plot this here, just isolating the first shell. And you can see pretty well from this that most of this oscillations here uh, in the original spectra in, shown in red, that's the, the, are pretty well reproduced by this first isolated first shell, but not perfectly isolated, uh, not perfectly reproduced. So there's definitely discrepancies here and here, and then there's this other stuff that down here where these other peaks were sort of out of phase. So let's go look at the other parts of the spectrum. If I look at this part here together, then you can see that whereas the main oscillation was peaked up here, you can, you can see that there's a peak here, a positive peak there in Chi of K from these two components together, and a peak here, and there, and there, and there. And in fact, if I look at just this, if I just isolate this, this further shell, that's a nice isolated Fourier transform, and it peaks up at almost twice. So where this is a maximum, this is, where the original data was a maximum, unfiltered data is a maximum, the, the, Fourier, the filtered is also a maximum here and here, and then in the places in between where these little peaks are here and here at seven and a half, and then again about eight, there's also a peak in the filtered portion of the spectrum there. So all of this stuff in the all of this stuff in the original in the unfiltered data comes from this higher shell. And that it's almost a, that it's almost perfectly in phase with the and, and twice the frequency as the uh, as the first shell means that it gives a boost an amplitude uh, increase to the uh, to all of these peaks here and all of these are slightly out of phase so that explains that spectra pretty well just to know that that that's two peaks two frequencies that are almost uh, twice the frequency from apart from each other and in fact there's then there's this little bit here why is this middle peak at about six inverse angst from slightly smaller than the two around it if I go back to this to showing these this sort of second and third and the fourth shell of iron metal together, you can see that that happens in the filtered spectra too. That there's, it's higher intensity here that, and lower intensity right at six, right where that peak is. So there's less intensity added there. And also out of phase, it seems like it, it's getting, it explains why those are slightly different, less intense than this peak and this peak here. If, if I just isolate that, shell completely, that middle shell here, you can see an, also a nice single oscillation that goes at, not quite at, at one and a half times the frequency, but close. Um, and it's going to destructively add at this six, angst, six inverse angstrom peak. So we're, whereas it's nearly in phase here and nearly in phase for this peak, it's almost completely out of phase for this peak at six angstroms. So that explains, so that little peak there in the Fourier transform explains why you have this reduction in intensity at six angstroms, uh, six inverse angstroms there. Um, so that that's one way that you can think about Fourier or use and think about Fourier analysis um, for in, uh, in looking at XF spectra. So there's not so much mystery to what all these very what all these variations and oscillations are in the unfiltered case-based data, it's just a mapping of all of these frequencies. If I pick all of these together, um, that pretty re pretty well reproduces the data. Um, and if I try to look at the stuff that's every everything else, say out to 10, 10 angstroms, that's a, that's a very good reproduction of the data. And if I look at that, then there's very small, but not, but not zero and pretty complicated other things going on in the spectrum. Um, and it might be hard to analyze those. We'll, we will just ignore. We will just ignore trying to analyze those um, portions of the spectra. Um, you can also see that even if I go out to ten angstroms, it's not everything. That there is actually for for some data sets, especially for strong absorbers, 
uh, so heavy metals, that there, uh, there's actually some intensity that goes past 10 angstroms. <clears throat> so I think that's good for the iron. I want to, I want to then look at, um, since we've looked at iron metal, now let's look at the copper metal. And in fact, I'm going to look at, so, so this data set, um, I'm going to look at just chi of K and just chi of R. Again, this is just another example. That's copper metal. That has similar things. You can see that there are other frequencies that must be happening there, but they're not as well separated in copper as they are in the iron case. In fact, if I plot those two together, um, that's the iron metal and the copper metal. And those look totally different. Well, you might say that's that's not so surprising that they look totally different because they are different metals. But if I so that's why I brought this nickel data along too. If I plot these these two together, those actually look remarkably similar. Now, there is a slight phase difference. There is a change in the distance, but actually those two oscillatory functions look pretty much the same. There's this, although at different places, there's this little. Uh, shoulder on around six angstroms, and there's this doublet peak here, and then there's even this shape. It's actually pretty similar in those two spectrum. If I show the Fourier transforms of those two together, they look like this. In fact, they both have this sort of humpy uh, three hump section of the of the second shell, and that is because these two these two metals have the same crystal structure. These are both uh, FCC metals, whereas iron is BCC. So it's a totally different uh, metal phase, if I plot the three of those together in, in K space, they look uh, quite different. And if I plot the three of them in R space, they, then clearly the copper and nickel look much more similar than the iron. And that's simply because, so those two peaks have sort of coalesced into a single peak there. Uh, and that's simply because the, the they have different crystal structures. In fact, if I plot the real parts of the Fourier transform for these, it's a little, a little uh, busy, but you can see that, the again, that the copper and nickel look pretty similar. There's a difference in bond distance for sure, but the, the nature of the oscillations is pretty, pretty similar, whereas the iron and copper look actually quite different. They're completely out of phase. They get completely out of phase. So that's why you would look at the so the Fourier transforms can be informative about, like, uh, even even without doing an analysis of what maybe the same kind of phase is uh, for some in some cases. So let's look at. I have one more data set to look at. Um, so I don't want to keep you too long. We have one more data set to look at, and that's this uh, data on palladium oxide. So this is a, a heavy, a heavier metal, um, palladium oxide, a heavier metal uh, with a. a with an oxygen atom. So here's the Fourier. So here's the data. It looks quite messy, um, with all these oscillations that you hard, maybe hard to understand. But and in the Fourier transform, there's sort of two main peaks, and then actually it continues out pretty well to um, high R. So let's look at. Let's also isolate the. Uh, I guess I should show you the window function that I use, the same one. I'm just using the same one for all. I'm not worrying about it. I'm also like just allowing the k min and max to be whatever the data is for all of these data sets. You can play with these as much as you'd like, but in the end, um, as long as you treat all the data the same, it, does, it mostly doesn't matter. So there are the, the spectra for for palladium oxide and the Fourier transform. And so let's look. Let's start looking at um, isolating those shells. So if I plot a, a window function, well, and plot the filtered, again, if I use the whole data range, I can reproduce the data pretty well. Here, at, even, even this stuff is reproduced well. At, that's all within the first 10 angstroms or so. And if I look at just the isolator per shell, uh, sorry, went the wrong way. Uh, just the isolator per shell, you can see uh, something here that again, with the oxygen, uh, it, it dominates at low K, whereas these higher peaks, which belong to the palladium, uh, dominate at high K. So the palladium sort of turns on at five angstroms, where the oxygen is just starting to turn off. And almost all of this is from the palladium-palladium spectrum. So in fact, if we go 
back and plot just chi of r. So I'm going to do this with this data set. And let's just pick different Fourier transform ranges with the raw data. So here I've said, let's just take the whole data range. Well, if I take not the whole data range, but I say, let's only Fourier transform from 2.5 to say, um, what's that going to be? Around 11 angstroms. Now, I want, and I want you to like notice this. The, First of all, because the K range is shorter, and I've taken out these high frequency, these this data, the Fourier transform is broadened from what it was when this was 16. So that's 11, and this is 16. Um, and you can see that there's a lot, there's more features. It's sharper. In fact, I'm going to I'm going to lower that to nine. It's not a, it's not unusual to actually have data that isn't so highly clean as this. Data set and so may only go out to eight or ten inverse angstroms. So it's important to understand what you what you lose when doing that and what is what is really there. Um, so here, if I go out from two point seven, I'm going to show the window function of that. I'm going from two point five to seven inverse angstroms, and now that oxygen peak is bigger than that palladium peak by quite a bit, almost twice as big or so. And that, that squares with what we saw earlier, that the palladium oscillations are really um, don't turn on until five inverse angstroms or so. So if I, if I reverse that and I say, let's just take the data out to 16, um, now that peak is bigger than the, than the, that second peak, that palladium peak is bigger than the oxygen peak. And if I say, well, let's just start the Fourier transform at five, ang five, then that peak has gotten even smaller. And if I started at nine, it's really small. In fact, if I started at nine, you'll notice something interesting, that this peak here has split. We'll get to that in a little, we'll get to that when we show some, uh, some calculations for what, how the XFs should be treated. In fact, this splitting of the palladium, palladium distance is not an artifact. It doesn't mean there's two different, two different distances. There is actually, when I did that oscillation or that isolation of the, of the frequency components. Um, sorry, I plotted, I wanted to plot this with the window and then this one with the filtered. And when I plotted uh, just that isolated palladium palladium shell, you'll notice that the filtered chi of K had this nice uniform uh, frequency was uniform, but it seemed like there was an amplitude dip. So these aren't really, and it's difficult to tell whether that's two close frequencies that are beating against each other, like a moray fringe or a, a beat in music, or, um, or, if that's, or if that's a real effect of just palladium scattering. It turns out that palladium scattering does that, that it's got an em, uh, envelope function to it that has a, um, that has an, a fairly complex shape. So that's understandable in, in, uh, from that point of view. But also, again, again I'll say that um, if I go back to this view of chi of k with the window function and look at just the high frequency components, then, uh, then the xfs is much emphasizes the high, the, the heavier elements. And if I uh, isolate just the low free, the low k components it emphasizes the low z elements so that's the same that's the same measurement and i and um, emphasizing different portions of the spectra uh, will will emphasize different portions of the different parts of this of the um, r space spectra you can also do this by showing that if I do a Fourier transform not with k squared, but with k to the first power, um, if I don't type that twice, that will have a similar effect. So if I go from 2 to 16, but use a k weight of 1, then these peaks are more or less even in intensity, or equal in intensity. And if I make that 2, then I'm emphasizing the high, R, the high k parts, and so the heavier elements. And if I make that k weight of 3, then I'm really emphasizing the, again, emphasizing even more the high k data and so emphasizing that's a that would be if I made this three so I'd be Fourier transforming that um, and let's let's just for make it a little bit 
further out. If I do, then we definitely are emphasizing this high K portion of the spectrum with a K weight of three. If I make those, I'm just, just a, the plotting of K weight of two and here doing the Fourier transform with K weight of two. So here I should say this Fourier, this K weighting just shows how to plot the K weighted chi of K and this K weighting affects how the Fourier transform is done. They don't need to be consistent, but it's nice for here that I want to make them consistent. So this is the Fourier transform of that chi of K data. And again, these are nearly equivalent. Those are nearly equivalent in um, intensity with a K weight of two, but if I make the K weight one, which is what this would show, then that's emphasizing the low, uh, the oxygen components, the low K components. So I hope that that's helped uh, you understand Fourier transforms for XFs. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below or uh, let me know and I'll be happy to uh, try to answer your questions. And again, this, this video is really transform really important for understanding uh, all the analysis that we'll do going forward. So thanks for your attention and see you in the next video.